Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Music Matters podcast. I'm so glad you're listening today. In this episode, you're going to meet the one and only Cody Raven Morris. This episode goes through so much more than just music. We talk about mindset and choices and really when you choose to do something, what are those eyes that are watching you thinking and how can your reactions impact someone else's day? The ripple effect is in full swing, my friends. This conversation goes so many different directions. I couldn't even just pick one. Hang tight and enjoy all the drops of wisdom that are about to come to you from this incredibly candid and meaningful conversation with superstar teacher, Cody Raven Morris. This episode is brought to you by Kinnison Choral Company. Make sure you check out all their fabulous rehearsal tracks, kinnisonchoralco.com. Use the code Music Matters at checkout for 20% off. Today, on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we welcome Cody Raven Morris. Doom, 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 doom. The crowd goes, and then I say, Why is your tone so airy? And then like, <laughs> yes! <laughs> Y'all, you might know Cody because of her car thoughts, which are epic and so amazing. I found car thoughts after I found Cody. Thank you. you. Folks, we're going to unpack that in a second. Tell us, who is Cody? Who is Cody Raven Morris? Well, hello, beautiful spirit, Emily. It's an honor to be here on the podcast, the podcast that people need to be on. Um, My name is Cody Raven Morris. I am first and foremost a lover of humans and then a lover of music. And I manifest that by being a choir director here in Houston, Texas. Very proud to be here in the South and uh, working with these kiddos. I got my master's at Michigan State University, undergrad at Texas State University, San Marcos. And in the past, it's been a wild six months. In the past six months, I've started a, a little business called Being Human Together which is a budding cross his finger nonprofit um, talking about taboo things that we should be talking about in the classroom, whether it be SEL or um, race relations and having conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion with our students, mm-hmm. talking about wellness, emphasis on spiritual and mental health, uh, things that we have said don't necessarily belong in our specific classrooms that are really part of the daily life of a healthy person. And if we focus on the whole body being healthy, then we get better quality musicians. We get artists who can think, you know, in a multitude of ways, caring for themselves and thus being capable of caring for others. So I also love to DJ. Um, I get my mix on. Those are some of my hobbies. I enjoy walks on the beach, but uh, on the beach, but not too fast uh, because <laughs> I may trip and fall. But uh, I'm, I'm just happy to be here, and I, I love making music and connecting with people as much as I can. Well, I'm so excited to introduce you to the listeners, and this is something I've been really looking forward to. You and I met through a series of ways, and it was just destiny that COVID webinars happened, and we ended up connecting and having some really great Zoom hangouts. Yeah. And what I love most is how quick you are to make things happen. So this new project in the last six months, tell us about this not-for-profit. Give us, you've given us a little overview. What does it look like? Where do you see it going? How does it fit with your actual choir job? So I will say, uh, I think it's important to begin at the beginning because according to Julie Andrews, it's a great place to start. Um, A very good place to start, to be clear. So it was June of 2020 and we're at, the beginning of what can only be called a new civil rights era uh, because we have the murder of George Floyd. And I'll be honest, in my own reflection as a black woman, I had two conflicts in my spirit. One, I need to do something. I need to say something because two, I have seen and ignored this for too long. And that's what happened with trauma. So 
sometimes we are quick to attack other people and say it's because, oh, you're just being complacent and oh, you just want to look the other way. But it's very difficult to look pain in the eye because we are afraid of what we may see back in the mirror. Hello. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people look in the mirror and they see their responsibility in the pain caused or in the trauma caused. And sometimes, and I will, um, and I can, I, I can say this, it's my experience. I, I was looking at this situation, uh, at this horrendous scenario and how it was playing out in my environment, the protests that were, were breaking out and realizing how many times had I flipped the channel on something like this happening because it was too much for me. Mm -hmm. And what we have done when it comes to things like that, when we ignore those conversations, what we actually do is normalize the content. Yes. And so I remember a faithful day. It was uh, May 31st, I want to say, that I got on Facebook and I made a post and I just said, what do I need to do to prove to people that hate is taught I have all this resources and things that I had done. I had done a presentation at the Texas Music Educator Conference just February of this year. Mm -hmm. I started working on the content, focusing on it at the end of my master's. Uh, my, though my master's is in choral conducting, I started focusing on equity and inclusion in choral music specifically because I was learning purely about old dead white men. And I was like, you know what? They made some bops, you know, they made hits. This is not, I'm not jumping to the, the hatred of Western music, but where was I? Mm -hmm. Where was my experience? It's crazy to think that that same content would be the foundation of a workshop that I would put on through Zoom on July, on, excuse me, on June 7th. And when I made that post and volunteered these resources, Several other people stepped in, a lot of my peers stepped in, and people who I weren't that close to who said, I want to work with you on this project. And then the matter of six days, we put on a broadcast through uh, uh, live streaming through Zoom. We did it through Facebook Live. And by the end of the week, uh, actually by the end, yeah, at the end of the weekend, we had 10,000 views. And that was oh. the first video. So we, yeah, we did three workshops under the umbrella of being human together. And then there was just this this craving for more when you do that kind of work you open yourself up uh, you have no choice but to be vulnerable and there is there are conversations that i had within that first week let alone the past six months that have opened my mind and expanded my thought of what needs to be happening in music education mm -hmm. so um i use my car thoughts i use the videos that i make to motivate students and motivate other people and, and kind of say the things that I think educators and students need to hear or want to hear in order to move forward. I use those videos and uh, and my, my website being humantogether.net along with the Facebook page to facilitate discussion. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. If I had to mm -hmm. sum it all up, no matter what topic if you throw in there, the biggest thing that I've realized in the past six months is people just forgot how to talk. Even when I sit, when I speak with my students in class in the past week or so with um, with this nationally recognized, I mean internationally recognized election, you know, the world has been watching the U.S. And when my students, I, I listen to their vocabulary when they say things like, oh, so-and-so who's a Republican was talking about Democrats all do this and Republicans all do this and they're going at each other's throat and another teacher may not be saying anything. And it's the visceral reactions of all those statements. And I tell them, and they're like, oh, I don't wanna talk about politics. I don't wanna talk about this. I do wanna talk about that. And everything is so heated. And I say, slow down, everybody slow down. It's not that you can't talk about politics. You just don't know how to talk. Right. And if you don't know how to have a conversation, how can we ever have one that's productive? You legit don't know what words mean. We're using words that you don't mean. You're using words and um, you don't understand how to listen in order to mm -hmm. process because you've been isolated. Man, the combination of civil unrest plus COVID has been wild. Right. That isolation factor. Uh, yes. Yes. Has has taken away like executive fun functioning skills mm -hmm. for some people. As far as when you listen, when we have a conversation with someone, we're going to listen to them. Um, we're going to not have our phone in our hands. Right. And I realized that the things that I used to say for discipline purposes, I'm now saying to like retrain the mind. Hey, when you talk with someone, you have to put your phone down. Or look at them. That's a big thing look too. Mm -hmm. Looking people in the eye, uh, I've been adjusting that phrasing because I'm I'm learning more that in other cultures, sometimes having your eyes down means that you're respecting the person that you're listening to. 
Okay. Which was hard for me to process because I grew up with someone saying, look me in the eye. If you're, Same. you want to act like a woman, look me in the eye. You want to be, yeah, you know? So in this vulnerable window of doing all this, this research, um, I, I realized that diversity research often comes from the perspective of the person doing it. So I'm always going to look out of it from the lens of a black woman. I have to thus work harder to look at things from the perspective of someone who is not a black woman. And that's the walk that we all have to do. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's what empathy is. Empathy is looking at things from the different perspective and I not, create, you know what I'm saying? And not the walk. Cause I, I tell my students all the time, you're not, this is not everyone's lived experience. Your lived experience is no one else's lived experience. And we look at the piece, how does this fit into your lived experience? Mm-hmm. And that's just little nuggets. For someone listening right now that wants to catch these three webinars that you live streamed back in June, can they find that on your website? They can find it on the, my website. They can also find it on YouTube under the Being Human Together YouTube page. Okay. I'll make sure that we'll have links to those workshops. I'll put all those in the news in the notes for this episode. And yeah. then for the future of this awesome project, what do you want to do next? I did not. Okay, I can tell you a secret. Don't tell anyone, Emily. Don't tell anyone. It's just between you and me. No one just else. Between you and me, and anyone who pushes play. <laughs> and anyone. <laughs> Shh, it's secret time. <laughs> hey guys, hey, it's secret time. I mean, not guys. I mean, peeps. Hello, peeps. <laughs> secret time. Okay, the secret is, I. Uh, <laughs> I whispered to my friend, Andre Jackson, he's a middle school choir director, fantastic human in Marble Falls, Texas. When I was doing the workshop at Team EA in February of this year, 2020, and he, we were just talking about the feedback from, from the presentation. He said, Cody, you should really go somewhere with this title. And I said, I actually have this vision of starting a nonprofit in which I can give scholarships to students in marginalized communities with a committee of my friends and this committee ever changes. So there's multitude of voices and we're always representing as many different kinds of beautiful humans as possible. And, you know, it expands into workshops and camps and, you know, just Mm. lecture talks around the world. And he's like, when are you thinking? And I'm like, 2024, I'll start thinking about it. (laughs) That's what I said. Insert COVID. Let's make it happen now. That's what happened. That's what happened. And I tell you, I'm a, I'm a very spiritual person. Um, I love me some Jesus. And I say that, uh, and as I tell my students, my way, uh, my faith is just the lens in which I decide to be good to people. That's really what your faith mm-hmm. should be. Christianity is the lens in which I decide to be good to people or, or how I facilitate being good. That being said, I have learned in my faith that I have often ignored the door that mm. God was trying to open for me because I definitely want to squeeze through a window. Oh. I got a lot of hips. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm like, oh, you're opening that door. Cool. I'm going to just go make my own door over here. So I'll see door. you when I figure out how to make a door. Oh, that door's still open. Cool. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, I'm grabbing a sledgehammer and I'm, yes. slamming through, I'm slamming through concrete that I'm not realizing that people have actually placed in front of me. This thing that I want so bad doesn't want me. And when I think about even undergrad, me was getting opportunities that for myself at 20, excuse me, 20, 21, 22, they were fantastic opportunities for me to step outside of my undergrad. And I was so determined to hang on to things because part of me is afraid of change, but we'll unpack that later. Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> well, you know, part of me is afraid of change. I'm afraid of what happens if I step into the unknown, which only takes one foot in front of the other as I'm holding on to these other opportunities. So my mentality now is if in all of this ugly, I was given this, Mm -hmm. if in all of this ugly, as I was trying to make all of these cool, like funny videos in my attic. And I was like, I do car thoughts all the time. And my rule with car thoughts is I don't make them unless I mean what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Sometimes like, someone gives me a topic to talk about and it just doesn't feel organic. I feel so, that. Yeah. So, and, and you know, you're an artist uh, and a creator in all aspects. And you know what it's like to be like, man, I am stuck and I can do this just to meet a deadline or I can wait until the muse kicks in. I can wait until I feel that call. I sat in my attic. It was wild, Emily. It was the end of the beginning of May when I finished 
and co- when I co- completed my oral exams, when I graduated mm. from Michigan State, I had this weird eye of the storm window where I was waking up when I wanted. I was virtually teaching in Texas from Michigan. I was already, yeah, I had, they, they had a sub and I was able, was blessed to have that job when all these doors, because of COVID were, were closing. I was placed in this position. I was already working. And then I was waking up with the sun naturally. I think everybody had a moment, even in their chaos, where they maybe found like a little quiet and peace. Mm -hmm. And I felt like there was another shoe coming. I felt like sooner or later, something's going to happen. And then here comes into May and everything just started moving. And what I, what I realized was taking over my body was passion that I had actually found rest and peace, even though there's so much pain that happened in COVID Mm -hmm. people, no matter what, one thing we can say about everyone was that we were forced to stop. Mm-hmm. And if you actually give into that, you give into that pool and you just decide, I'm going to stop, I'm going to rest my mind, I'm going to pause for a moment, the car thoughts pause, the videos pause, then when I was called to action, when we were called to action, content, 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 mm-hmm. and I was able to create. So my mindset is, if I feel the tide pulling me in a direction, then I'm going to call it the door that has opened up. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to let my obligations um keep me someplace or stop me from from pursuing that a friend said god will ordain or as as i say to my uh to students and other people no matter what your faith or the absence of the energy everything that you want to do in the world is already ordained and determined everything that you want to do you are completely capable of doing it only if you are meant to do it so when you push that resistance when you feel that resistance it's not that you're incapable it's just that it's not your time it's not your time for that there is something else that is calling for your attention Mm -hmm. something else needs you Mm -hmm. we can want and want and want all day but that's our fault as man i didn't mean to preach it's just how this is exactly (laughs) what we needed i love this i love hearing all this okay i'm i love this human together Let's kind of switch because you mentioned it. I just watched your latest Car Thoughts twice. <gasps> and I would I, I always watch the Car Thoughts. They make me smile. They I never know what direction they're going to go. But I have to admit, you, you start talking about this negative Nancy in your car talk. And I'm like sitting back grabbing my popcorn thinking, ooh, what's Nancy going to do? What is and Nancy going to do? I feel like my bias was showing Because I was expecting Nancy to do something really. I thought she'd be the next Karen. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you come at it and you're like, this is what you need to take away from this. I'm like, oh my gosh, reality check this. Okay, tell us about your latest car thought. Okay, I will. (laughs) So so thank you so much for watching my my car thoughts. I'm afraid of the day that someone films me making them for for, for listeners who, uh, who may not know. Car Thoughts with Cody, I started making them when uh, in 2013, which was one of my, my first semesters teaching in Houston. And that's when Instagram only had 15 second videos. And I'm thinking, I can't get fired in 15 seconds. Well, I mean, a lot of people do. <laughs> but I was, at the time, young naive me was like, oh, it'll be fine. And I just had a very creative way to vent about stuff that all teachers wanted to vent about. And then as the videos got longer, one thing that I found interesting was that my students found them first because my Instagram page was public as a DJ and everything that I had on there was just art. There was no personal things on there, but teacher me is personal. me. You know, the, I speak the same, you know, the same lingo and the way that I was talking on my Instagram was more authentic than what I was doing in the classroom. Mm. And the students revealed that to me. So then it became like, okay, well, I guess I'll share this you know, a little bit more. So, so fast forward, so, shoot seven going on eight years now. Um, well, we're, oh my gosh, we're in the seventh season. <laughs> oh, so many um, this car thoughts, I was talking about bringing my car to uh, my actual vehicle to the car shop, to the, uh, the mechanic. I was like, what do you call that place where things get fixed? You'll understand why I don't know what these places are called in a second. I bring my car to a place where it's supposed to be healed. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the story, I don't have my vehicle because when they went to bring my car in for an inspection, they actually got into a accident with my car. And all I wanted was a new sticker, dang it. That's all I wanted was a sticker for my inspection. And now I don't have that. Um, but the way that I was being told 
kind of plays with the listener's ear because I was watching several people, uh, several uh, the same mechanic coming in to speak with several different people to let them know that their car was ready. And I got somebody different. And this person did not make negative it clear. Nancy. I got, I got my negative Nancy, right? And this person did not make it clear why they were coming to speak with me. They just told me to grab my belongings. They told me to move to a different location. I felt very isolated. I was not in an area that I'm used to being in, but I just stayed uh, as optimistic as possible. And I just attempted not to assume the worst because it's so easy to do that. It's so easy. This is before I know what is, is about to happen. There is something quite suspicious about the way the scenario was set up. What I would discover is that Nancy was just nervous. Nancy was nervous to tell me the news that, yeah, I brought my car to a place that it wasn't supposed to be damaged and that it was damaged. And um, they had already made a plan. And that was really the purpose of the story was that there was no need for me to be upset because they presented the problem to me and they had a plan. Your car was in an accident, which is a big deal but we have a rental car ready. We're paying for everything. Your insurance doesn't have to cover everything. We'll have you out of here in an hour. That's awesome. But what I found interesting and I thought about, I mean, days after I drove away was how long it took her to tell me the steps that it took for her to communicate this to me. And then when I got outside all of the eyes, all of the people who spent their, their afternoon, who come from a multitude of different ethnicities and backgrounds, I don't know their story, but all I know is everyone was very hesitant to, to speak to me prior to giving me this information, even after the information. It's the suspicious way that we go about, you know, those kind of leaning. How are they going to handle this news? Right, 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 right. And I, and you know, from one perspective, I can see how Oh, I can very much see why they are nervous because they hurt my baby. I mean, my door is in half. Y'all, there was a bucket in the road. An old boy got out of his car and said, this bucket life matters. <laughs> and I'm going to grab this bucket and abandon my car. I'm telling you, there's a lot of metaphors going on. There's so much we can unpack with this one car thought experience, honey. There's a lot going on. He decided he grabbed my car from the parking spot, pulled it in, saw a bucket in the road and said, you know what? This is now my new priority. Did not put my car in park and backed up or my car backed up on its own. It said, I got to get out of here. This guy's not responsible and was injured in the process. My car, my door is just in half. It wouldn't shut. Yeah. Uh, so, and you know how the way these modern cars are made, it's, it's a whole new deal. They're, you know, it's not one of those hot water, boiling water tricks where I like pull out a dent. That, that's not what's happening. Um, but I was, especially that it was election day, there was just something about that entire energy that made me feel like, oh, wait, you were doing all this on election day. I had forgotten that part of the story. <gasps> yeah. Yes, because my tag was out. And I was like, the last thing I need is to give the police a reason to pull me over. I was like, let me handle my business in the name of patriotism. I'm just kidding. That is not an act of patriotism. But I was like, in so the you name of- you get this America. news on, on election day. On election day. They, yeah. Okay, so you're outside. All these eyes are on you. Mm -hmm. Can we unpack that a little bit more? Because I think that's the metaphor. I really want to drive home. Oh, yeah. And, and that, that was the, the one thing in the car thoughts that I wish I would have added today was, then I noticed that there were all of these eyes and what I wish I would have added was, and there's a lot to unpack there, but we don't have time for that. We, there do, was, now. I, we do now, I subconsciously know that there's a part of them waiting for the black woman to react loudly, to react dramatically, to take things over the top. And there's someone out there right now who may be listening and is thinking, why does it always have to come down to color? And I want to circle back to the beginning. That empathy comes down to understanding and listening to someone's experience without it having to be explicitly explained. My has, experience has taught me that those looks are waiting for me to make a misstep. Those looks are waiting for me to do something that fulfills a stereotype. Ooh, and the next part of the car thoughts would reveal that I actually didn't notice the looks until Nancy, you know, name change for privacy. And also they still have my car, you know, but then, <laughs> never forget, I'm still in a rental. You're still right now in the rental? I'm still oh, in the rental. I'm so sorry. It's like a week later. Yeah, I may not see that car until after Thanksgiving. 
they may say merry christmas here's your car back and i'm like that's actually not how you give gifts you don't give me back my thing you give me a new thing <laughs> poor negative nancy come on negative nancy but i remember when she said oh wow you're so you're so chill about this how can you be so chill and that's when i noticed everybody else so even if you take my ethnicity out of the picture, maybe you take out the fact that I'm a woman, you walked in with the expectation. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. There is an expectation. We are taught to prepare ourselves for danger. But I'm not danger. Mm -mm. You aren't danger. Mm -mm. That's not a life or death situation. No one was physically harmed. That was at my first reaction when they said, we have something to tell you. We don't know how to tell you. We got into an accident with your car and and I'm just gonna say it, you need a new door. And my reaction was, is everyone okay? Because that's what caring for humans means. We can get down to the dollar line at the end of the day. I'm not some angel saint where money is not a factor. I got bills, okay? I used to be homeless. This is not a joke. <laughs> I, need, I need to be able to eat and sleep. I get it. But to look at people and prepare yourself for a visceral reaction means that we're going about having conversations and interactions with people where we are preparing for war. Mm. Who can live their life in a constant state of terror? Who how can did, live their life like how that? How did you know? You didn't know what she was going to say. Mm -mm. What do you do to prepare yourself to stay even kill? When she asks you, why are you so chill about this situation? What my did you response, say? My response was, with everything happening in the world, this is the least of my worries. You've already answered all of my questions. Who's paying for it? Not me, the dealership. How will I leave here? A rental car that I'm also not paying for. That seems like a sweet deal. When you think about what's actually happening though, it's just the just thing to do. It was the right thing to do. The right thing doesn't have to be bright and shiny. I think we glorify good deeds through social media. We've always done it. It started with simple pictures and selfies of people with little children in Uganda or an African country. It upgraded and moved here to the US. When we take a picture, when we hand a homeless person a dollar, we think it's cute to advertise the fact that, look, I went to a homeless shelter this weekend and gave out food. We glorify giant acts. And we forget to acknowledge when people are just good, you just do it because you're supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. They did what they were supposed to do. It's very upsetting, but what am I gonna do? Continue to pass on that negativity? Cause think about all the people I interacted with in less mm -hmm. than an hour. I met the general manager. I met the guy who was going to do the inspection. And I met the person who did, got into the accident. From there, I met the person who drove me to the rental car place and the person who gave me the car. If I would have decided, if I would have allowed, not decide, because you have to decide. Mm -hmm, before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The decision part of your has walk. to be a before. It's your, it's your every day. It's, it's your it every day. It loops back to that conversation. You have to learn how to converse. You have to decide how to be, oh, mm -hmm. this is good. Yes. And I said, <laughs> I have so many more things to worry about. You've already answered all of my questions. Now, the only thing I can't get back is my time. Okay, and this is the part where <laughs> in the 90s TV show, this is the part where the screen freezes and you go, now you're probably wondering how I got here. This is what happens when you talk about time. You, the individual, have to think, uh, go to your executive functioning space, right, in your brain. And you have to ask yourself, how precious is the time that I lost? Our biggest go-to phrase with time is money. Time is equal to money. But really, how precious is the time that I lost? I can't go to the mall right now. I was gonna have to throw on a mask anyway and like run into the store and my feet hurt. Okay, well, that's just off the agenda. That can be moved. Mm -hmm. Something happened and now I can't go do this other thing. So the schedule changes. See, we like to pick and choose what rules we wanna listen to. So if I sit in the professional development, right? And someone tells me that I need to be flexible with my lesson plans, but then I go to the car dealership and someone has an accident and I, actually, and I pop off, I get yes. angry. What I actually did was, it's not that I was patient at school, but I'm not patient in the street. What I actually did was, instead of actually giving into flexibility in my classroom, instead of actually letting things organically happen in my classroom, I just put that hate and that anger and all of that tension on pause. And I decided beforehand that the next opportunity I'm going to get to displace this feeling, I'm going to put it on the next person I encounter. Mm -hmm. If I didn't really believe the things that I am saying in my classroom, I could have easily 
easily gotten angry and I've done it before because I'm a human. I can't think of it. Who in the world has not done that? Right. They even say that they have journals of Mother Teresa when she had doubt in her faith. Mm -hmm. People are humans. And some people say, oh, well, then Mother Teresa isn't a saint. Oh, these people aren't great. We try to criminalize people for being human instead of remembering how hard and the work that it takes to be good. Mm -hmm. And to be good is a continuous walk. And it's a walk that allows you to be pressured, not in the way that, 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 that causes negativity, but pressure how coal turns into diamonds. Yes. And imagine if all of our coals together, like imagine the way that coal burns, how, how the embers burn when coals are together in a fire. That's what we should do together, not to cause chaos, but to shine so freaking bright. When you make the decision ahead of time, when you wake up, and you take care of yourself, whether it be yoga, whether it be workout, whether it be as simple as I got enough sleep last night, mm -hmm. I ate breakfast. You are never too busy to take care of yourself mm -hmm. because if you are, you're doing it wrong. Right. And I've had to make these kind of concrete, these are the things in my life that are now concrete. Right. I may not get the whole lesson plan done. I may not be able to do that social thing that I wanted to do, but did I take care of myself? Mm -hmm. And that's so true because we're seeing so much burnout and so much exhaustion. Mm -hmm. But like you said a few moments ago, no one died. No one died. You can readjust the schedule. You can be flexible. It's a choir concert. That's... It's a choir concert. It's a it's, performance. It's, it's choir. It's music. And it's fulfilling. And there's so much to it, which is why we love it. And it brings yeah. people together. Yes. But now is not the time to be having sleepless nights over your virtual choir holiday concert. Amen. 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 I have a performance, my first performance with my program next Tuesday. And I'll be excited for all 13 of the kids that I may have on campus that day to show up. And I'm going to make it work. And I have about three backup plans in my head for yeah. this time that I chose about it might just be us in unison for 30 mm -hmm. seconds. It might be the whole round in parts for three and a half minutes. But I have to know that whatever I put forth is the best that I could do. And I would be proud of it either way. That level of flexibility, here's all the transparent wo words. It's annoying. And I wish I didn't have to do it like this and shoulda, coulda, woulda, I can say all those things. I can exhaust myself wishing and hoping that I could walk through this other door or I could be grateful that I have this other one I have these new opportunities. Now, let me give you a disclaimer. I am not talking about toxic positivity. I'm not talking about pretending that everything around you is completely fine. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with grieving. Mm -hmm. but grieving comes at a fortnight. Grieving comes at a season. Sooner or later, you have to get up. It doesn't matter what faith you look, like, look at. There's a text in every faith and in language about grief only lasting for a moment. And then you get up and the next time you fall, you cry and guess what you're gonna do? Get back up. We're gonna get right back up. And it ties so nicely into the eyes of those people looking. Those yes. students yes. are gonna be watching for your reaction on that game day, on that performance day. And they're like, okay, how's she handling it? What's she gonna do? And are you showing up angry and frustrated? Or are you like, hey, look at this awesome thing we have today. Mm -hmm. That's not toxic positivity. That's no, just it's not. choosing, just like you made the choice. Control what you can control. Be kind. Girl, let me tell you a story. Yes, I love your story. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a, the Texas contest system or our festival system is referred to as UIL. And at one point in time in my life, I was in a very high pressure community where the, the motto lent itself to success was the only option. And that success had to be superior ratings and nothing else would be accepted. So there was a particular year, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grateful that I've had very hardworking students and have had fantastic mentors to have a lot of success with the programs that I've had. There was one particular year where the ensembles that I took to contest, though they got one superior ratings in the sight reading room, they got twos on the stage for their concert performance. Well, on a scale of one of five, where one is superior, two is excellent. It's an excellent. 
And I still remember the feeling of my best friend's hand on my back as I'm having a panic attack in the car because of twos. That was the first memory that I had. I would need some time in the past to remember the other thing that I did, which was worse, is I cried on the bus. When we came back from contest, I cried on the bus in front of those kids. And in my silent tears, I told those kids they weren't good enough. And if they ever hear this, I am so sorry. And I promise you that I learned from that moment. I learned from that moment. That was one of my first year teaching. I'm gonna fast forward to the same thing happened when I left my previous school. I was preparing to go to grad school. Um, some of my music was adventurous. Some of my repertoire choices were. Yes. <laughs> I was reading. You can't see her face, but like I knew that that was the word you were about to pick. Yeah, I had some uh, unique, unique choices for, for freshmen, for freshmen to engage in. And they, they, sang, they sang them notes. They didn't quite sing them, but they sang those notes. And guess what? We came back with excellent ratings. We came back with twos they had very high standards. Now they're the ones that are mad. And I walked in the, uh, the room the next day and I said, how did we do at contest yesterday? And they're like, terrible, we were trash, we were the worst. And I'm like, yeah, we're gonna use real words because we know how to actually articulate things. So I put in the CD, I, I'm a little smart aleck when I teach, I put in the CD, we listen. I have them do a concert evaluation where they actually tell me exactly what happened. And they're like, okay, did you actually deserve the score you got? They go, yes. I'm like, okay, and you know why? A two in my book, is actually a one where you taught them you could teach sing in tune and then you didn't. That's what hurts about a two. <laughs> you know, where you're like, ooh, that one song, ooh, that one line. When I took that score, I said, let's put that in your calendar. This is April. You were my freshman who were the, um, the first to arrive to Squire Socials. You were the first to have perfect attendance at concerts. You went to solo and ensemble and you had the most kids sign up for solo and ensemble. You got on the bus. You got on the bus to go to region, even though it was difficult. You are so kind to each other. You give each other positive affirmations. When you do wrong, you make corrections. You come to me with the plan, the maturity. And I just praise them. And I call that the transcript. Mm. I take students through an academic transcript. The end of the year comes and you see your GPA, you figure out what you got in your classes. So we did a personal transcript. And I mean, this mm. was just me freestyling on the board. And then I put their UIL scores. And then I put the music that they were prepping for the end of the year for pop show and how many of them had made varsity and what their plans were. And I said, in the full list of it, look at your transcript. Does it matter at the end of the day? Is that one thing? Right. What matters in comparison to all this? And they're like, no, we're cool. And I'm like, yeah, you are. And I think what, it's the perspective of all of it. And I think the hard reality that a lot of teachers, including myself, had to realize in COVID was how much of their teaching was preparing students for every day and how much of their teaching was preparing them from the same test that we get angry about with our core curricular classes. Oh, no. Had a little a little fall. See, I was preaching and something fell. But yeah, yeah how, that was good. Yeah, how, how much of it is preparing for a test? You're saying all the things we need to hear right now because my students at the university are getting ready for juries and finals. We have one more week of lectures before everything kind of starts wrapping up. Mm. And it's so interesting to see they're they're burned out. Yeah. But yet they're optimistic. They're so mm -hmm. proud of what they've learned. As they should be. They should be extremely proud of, of those things. It's incredible, but it's all about that perspective. Mm -hmm. And and knowing what actually fulfills you. I, I shared with students today in an activity that for a long time, especially in the days when I was crying over excellent ratings, how pompous is that? In those moments, I thought that I was feeling adrenaline. And then I went up to Michigan State because you know, grad school is a very selfish thing. And when I, and when someone, when a mentor told me that, my mentor, Denise Eaton said that to me, she said, Cody, you know, college is very selfish. You know, I just been on this show like three or four times. <laughs> she has? Queen, mother. She such a queen. She, she recorded is... four episodes. I think I've released two on the main page and two others on my Patreon page. She's incredible. 
she's incredible. Period. Great mentor choice. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Just had to no. have a little praise for the Denise Eaton. Oh no, content creator. Yes. Uh, you know, arranger, conductor, educator. Denise Eaton is everything, and um, she caring for me as a friend does, as a mentor does. Want to make sure that I had the right mindset going into grad school, and I was super excited. I'm going to do all these things, and yeah, 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 yeah. And I got up there in grad school, college, being a student means that you're being guided by somebody else. And I forgot that I'd, I'd never had that patience, actually. Undergrad me didn't have that patience. That's part of the reason why I had to take a couple of classes more than once. Yeah, I'm paying interest on some decisions now with Sally May and the government. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but I go to the grad school and I'm like, well, you can't afford to mess this one up because this scholarship only happens one time. <laughs> so I need to get this right. I got to get this right. And what happened is that in the slowing down to focus on something and me being incapable of or not, or having to make the decision to not do things that would purposely distract me i realized that the adrenaline that i had felt for so long was not adrenaline adrenaline it was anxiety mm -hmm. and i was moving so fast that i didn't even know what my anxiety felt like when i did finally feel it it's kind of like when you go to the dentist only if your teeth hurt, mm -hmm. I wasn't doing regular checkups on myself. And now I find myself in excruciating pain. I found my anxiety uncontrollable and I, I'm alone and I feel so depressed. And I think that it's only me, but what I realized it, it's a career habit. Yes, Education is a career habit of avoiding the core and the roots of our anxiety and our stresses because we are being told that we are heroes, which we are. We're being told that we can handle anything, which we can. Right. And so we find ourselves in positions where people tell us we're unstoppable. So then we don't stop. Right. Or we keep going yeah. because that's the expectation. Yes. Who set that expectation? Or, really, who did it? Right. <laughs> and when you think about those, the doors, we talked about doors earlier. And we've had wonderful people like Denise Eaton and Dr. Lynn Gackle and a lot of really strong women that have come and opened the doors for mm -hmm. us. But do we still have to go through those doors or can we, uh, is it, can we sledgehammer our own door now? You know what I'm saying? It's not an interesting concept that we have a, it is a hereditary thing for, for people in marginalized situations to continue to create paths for each other. That's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But can we fast track this? Like with my, when I get a new student who comes in my classroom and they smack their lips and they don't have their music and they get all mad, right? And everyone's like, ooh, write them up. That's a bad kid. Get them a referral, suspend them. You know what I say to kids? Can we skip past the part where you cuss me out underneath your breath? Can we skip past the part where you just hate me for no reason? And can we skip to the part where you realize that I love you and I care for you and I'm only putting up with this because I know that you're capable of more. When you're ready to skip past this part, you can meet me. So that's one of the ways that I stopped carrying stress of students home. Yes. That doesn't mean I'm not worrying about these babies, but that whole thing of going to sleep because so-and-so is so bad. No, 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 no. So-and-so is crying out for help. Let's just go ahead and skip that part, teachers. Let's skip that part where children walk in our room and we believe that they are inherently bad. That's where your bias shows. Amen. Oh, this is gold. <laughs> if we skip that part, yes. we'll get to the part where we can start making the plan to heal the child. Actually, here's a better statement. We can start making the plan to teach that child mm -hmm. to have the tools to heal themselves. Because believe me. I've had a generation of students that when they graduated, I thought that I had made independent people, but I realized I had just made people who were dependent on me. And I will say that is my Achilles heel as I have to watch sometimes in my lessons that when I teach them something, when I share stories with them, that I actually give them the tool. And I know if I didn't do it, cause then they'll be in my class every class period. Right. Or they have discipline issues with everyone except for me. And I'm like, right. ah. Then you haven't given them the tool. But yeah. look at all the tools you've given us today about walking in with the kindness mindset that you believe and that you support no matter what your beliefs are. Mm -hmm. Take the time to grieve, but it is a time. And then step up and heal, whether that is through checking your anxiety, through teaching and equipping our people or equipping yourself. Yes. And putting things in perspective. Choir is amazing, but it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Celebrate what you have. 
over here having panic attacks about all this stuff. Yes, I'm over here having panic attacks about all this stuff. And I had to realize for my own health, music is my life, but it is not worth dying for. And there are people who have judged me for that statement. And I'm like, I can't live in this. Is that it for you? Look, we're at a job 80% of our lives, 80% of our lives. That a friend told me that, and that's what helped me make a big life change. If you're going to be there 80%, you better be happy and you better be well-rounded, mm -hmm. right? So you have to remember that at the end of the day, the schoolhouse is going to be there, no matter who's going to be there. There's going to be walls and there's going to be a ceiling and there's going to be a teacher in every class. Those kids are going to be taught. You were hired for a reason though. Mm -hmm. You, the human, were hired for a reason. So if you are there for a reason, nobody wants the skeleton version of you. Nobody wants the shell version of you. It is just as much of your duty to take care of your mental health, physical health, spiritual health, take care of your body, take care of your voice, mm -hmm. take care of that beautiful instrument that decided that, that guided you, navigated you like Ariel's voice, guided you to the classroom, right? It is just as much of your duty to take care of all of those things, to have your priorities, priorities in and out of the classroom as it is to teach those kids and prepare them for the next concert, the next performance, the next virtual video, the next unison canon, the next clap along, whatever's going down. If you bring your best self into the classroom, that's the person that the students in front of you will model. And believe me, they need models. Children need models more than ever now, not just of how to be kind people, not just how to be, and, and kind, I, I want to be cautious with that word because kind does not mean fake. When I say kind, I mean empathetic. That's what I'm really, what I really want to say. They need examples of not just being great artists, but being empathetic people how to have difficult conversations, how to know that sometimes when you disagree with people, we're not gonna go with the statement, well, let's just agree to disagree. No, let's table this conversation until we both go off and we learn more. Challenge students to go off and learn more so they can contribute more quality, more energy and focus to the next conversation. They don't know how to do follow-ups. We Google our answers and we get things super fast. So if we don't get it the first time, we give up on each other. We right. give up on each other. Mm. You can't do that. You can't do that. We can't our give up on each other now. <laughs> more than ever, we can't give up on each other. And, and people have. And that's what's so sad. That's what really sad at the end of the day, that our faith in humanity to evolve stopped. Look at the history of the world. I used to hate history. I used to hate history class. And I remember, I remember listening to Daniel Pink come speak at Texas State. No way. I own multiple yes. books. Yes, girl. What? I saw him with my eyes. I saw him with my eyes. Woo! It was great. And Daniel Pink came. And I went, you know, because extra credit, right? So I went when I was at Texas State. And I called my music education professor and great choir director, Dr. Lynn Brinkmeyer. I called she's her. also been on the show and she's also epic. For a commercial break for the fact, I just got to insert this right here. I am honored to be amongst this caliber of women. So thank you so much for, for oh having me. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. You're wonderful and totally in that caliber. Thank you. Oh, but I was talking with Dr. Brinkmeyer and, uh, I'm so grateful she answered the phone. I think she was having a teacher moment where she's like, this phone call is very important because it was 11 o'clock at night. And she's like, Cody, how, you know, what's going on? And I'm like, I realized that if I put as much energy into history class as I put into choir, I would be unstoppable. And she's like, yeah, you would. And older me would realize the reason why I didn't invest in history was because I was afraid of what I was gonna see, just like I changed the channel every time. It's all connected because it actually is all connected. Yes, so it is all connected. It actually is connected. Everything. My, my lack for history is the same reason why I had a lack of empathy, because I was afraid to look in the mirror and see what we have been doing. And as I said to my students, after this election, I said, no matter what you think or what your parents think, think, the one thing we need to take away from this is that we were not responsible between the lines or at the comma. Who is it, Craig Heller Johnson, who talks about the music that's made in the breath, the music made at the comma, because we just think arrest is an absence of sound. No, it's not. It's life, it's air breathed, in, uh, breathed into a phrase. Mm -hmm. And what we do with that moment, oh, 
when you know when you're in a performance and someone takes that breath just a second longer than you think and then they go back into the next phrase almost like they fall into the phrase yeah that's what life is life is that moment in between and i realized that as a citizen of this country as a member of this planet that i had not treated life with the same type of delicacy that it deserved i did not tend to the comma oh that that needs to be the thing that matters i always let the guests at the very end of the show what's one thing that really matters that you should walk away from this episode with i'll go with 10 with 10 to the comma 10 it's, to the comma it's the in between time it's the the moments of quiet when you are alone where do your thoughts go when you see a stranger down the street do you wonder how they're doing have they eaten are they safe are they happy or do you judge them do biases surface do you question why they are and where they are where they are when you make music with students and students approach you with the various things on their mind have you spiritually prepared yourself prior to that interaction with the children have you prepared yourself have you prayed? Have you meditated? Whether it's, I call it juju. We wingle our fingers at kids. I was like, it doesn't matter what you believe or what you don't believe. Juju is the magic of class of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Have you put juju in the air for well wishes for those around you, for the safety and the health of those? It's what happens in the comma, what happens in your thoughts, how you prepare the spirit. It's the reason why you stretch between exercises. Because as someone who was so used, I, I take boxing. And when I box, you know, I hit this bag hard and I have all these visceral reactions, right? Euphoria or anger. And I put all these things in the bag, but you know what always leads me to energy? What I don't do in the comma, I don't stretch. Mm. So now with my students, I stretch like three or four times a day. We do yoga. You know, I leave school feeling physically better than I go to school because I do more stretching on campus. Mm. I had that thought today driving to this conversation i was like my body feels better because i have it in the practice mm -hmm. i need to bring more of that into my home it's that comma tending it's the comma. comma and into the comma man cody i'm so thankful that you had time today girl this was Thank fun you. you're gonna be back like let's just go ahead and throw that out there let's, yeah. let's put the juju out there you're gonna be back uh, i really look forward to it this has been really wonderful and i'm sincerely excited to listen again and share it because you've dropped a lot that we need to hear as we go into Thanksgiving, as mm. we go into the holidays, as we reset up for the next year. Thank you for being authentically you. Thank you for having me. And I hope that something I have said has touched your ears and touched the listeners ears and feel free to re reach out through the multitude of mediums that Emily will provide. Yes, I will put tons of stuff in the notes. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to push stop. I tried to pick one line to say right now to wrap this entire conversation up. And I think Cody did it perfect. Let's live in that comma, live in that breath, live in the silent space. How do you breathe in? How do you exhale? How are you choosing to make the best of what's in front of you right now? Because my friend, we are so lucky that you exist on this planet. Whatever you're doing right now, know that it really matters. If you need more ideas, more support, check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash musicedmatters. If you need me, I'm here for you. You can find contact information on my website, emilybirch.org. Check it out on Patreon. Find me on Instagram or social media, whatever your jam is. You're not alone. Let's get a real perspective here and let's figure out how we can all live as our best selves in that comma and impact the world around us for sincere and wonderful good. Don't change the channel, just breathe in. What you're doing matters, music matters, and I'll see you next time on the Music Matters Podcast. Mm -hmm.